Hello, welcome to VR Roundtable, episode 36. My name is Gary and joining me this week is Steve. And it's only Steve this week because Chris and Anthony are not able to uh, make it this week, unfortunately. They're both a little bit busy, but uh, hopefully they'll be back for the next episode. But uh, on this week, we've got a few new stories that we come to talk about anyway. We've got uh, all the latest developments from Google at Google I.O. So we'll go through all of that stuff. Um, Steve, how are you this week? I am doing super good. Um, I got back from Europe. I uh, had some work and I got back in late on Thursday night and we're recording this here on s relatively early Saturday and uh, I've really still catching up. Uh, I woke up yesterday morning at 4 a.m. local time. I woke up this morning at 5 a.m. local time. So by the time Monday comes around next week to go back to work, I'll, I should be, you know, re readjusted. But I hate uh, uh, time zone alignment. It's a pain in the butt. Yeah, I've never been far enough to really get majorly jet, lag, jet lagged or anything like that. So the furthest I've been from uh, the UK is Greece, I think. That's uh, as far as I've gone, which is about, I don't even know exactly how far ahead that is. I think it's sort of three or four hours ahead of us over here in the UK. So I've not experienced anything like you have. Yeah, uh, when you're six hours, and honestly, there's you know some people that get the full twelve hour offset, and that that's got to be really hard. You know, I mean, six is a big deal, but twelve is yeah, I couldn't comprehend really. No. Okay, let's get straight into the news this week anyway, because we have got a few things to cover. It might be a little bit of a, a shorter episode this week because there's only the two of us and, uh, you know, we, we'll go through all the, the main news stories that we've got, so we'll see how we get on. Um, but the first one that we want to talk about is uh, the from the from this is from the Google I.O. Uh, conference, and this was that Google announced a standalone VR headset or a, a series of VR headsets, actually. This was um, because they're teaming up with HTC and Lenovo Novo uh, to manufacture these headsets. These are the two manufacturers who have been confirmed so far. And uh, they're calling the technology behind these headsets, which uh, allows six degrees of freedom movement, uh, world sense. This is the, the, the name of the technology that they're using. Now, these headsets are based on a reference design from Qualcomm, which I think was shown off at CES. I haven't got this in my notes, but I believe it was shown off at, at CES this year, um, a Qualcomm headset, which um, had this kind of technology behind it. Now, they're using using a Snapdragon 835 processor, um, which is a little bit of an update on the Pixel phone, which is the, the Daydream phone from Google, which uses a Snapdragon 821. Now, the actual differences in the specs of this processor have not really been confirmed at the moment, I don't believe. But just to talk about this, these headsets that are, are being released. So they are using technology based on Qualcomm's uh, reference design, which uses six degrees of freedom. So this allows you to uh, move around, not just use rotational uh, head movement, but also positional head movement as well. Now they haven't, th there's a little bit of confusion about this headset. I don't know if you saw this, Steve, but there was a bit of confusion about whether this headset will actually allow full room scale um, sort of movement in virtual reality because the wording and the video that they released that, that was shown at Google I.O. this week, it only shown somebody wearing the headset who was sort of dodging slightly out of the way. So I don't know if it will allow full room scale movement or not, but um, that's something that I wanted to mention. But Steve, what, what did you think of this? There's a few other little things I can mention, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, this is a, a big announcement. And, you know, like, so to try to unpack it all, it's kind of hard in, in uh, one fell swoop. But, uh, you know, basically, you know, to, at, from a high level, I've I've completely flipped. You know, when I first got my Vive, I was was very much under the belief that the lighthouse tracking was the the end all be all. And and it is from a from a performance standpoint, it is clearly the the best on the market, and and, and may be that for a while. Um, but but now you know, as I, as I look at the adoption of VR, I'm I believe inside out tracking is the future, and I believe that because it's really it's it's all about consumer ease. And both of these, and and, and I feel like the the big companies, uh, Google, Val, uh, uh, um, HTC, Lenovo, all these names that we're dropping, I think they feel the same way um, because it, it seems to be the last two, three months um, in conjunction with the Microsoft holographic units that that we're getting this big push. 
uh, for for a simpler uh, VR experience. So, um, I, I think I think it's fantastic. I, I'm very like we we actually know very little on, on the units. You know, we we've gotten the kind of the the high level uh, breakdown of what word world sense is, uh, but beyond that, we don't have any specs on the these these HMDs themselves. And there is a little ambiguity, as you mentioned, regarding the uh, six degrees of freedom and whether or not. To, to what degree they support it. So my my stance is, or, or my, um, sorry, my interpretation is that with six degrees of freedom, that is room scale to to a sense where it it's positional tracking of the headspace, the headset and not just rotational up, down, left, right, um, just fixed in one spot looking around. So um, six degrees of freedom was stated now what isn't clear and, and I think it may be um, it's it's possible that that Google's world sense will support 6 DOF but maybe not every headset will so it, it's it's possible maybe the HTC headset won't uh, but the Lenovo one will uh, or future ones down the line so there's a lot that needs to come out in reference to these headsets uh, and one thing and I really, really hope they announce it is PC support. Like I get having the all-in-one integrated. I get the selling tagline of you don't need a phone for your VR. You don't need a PC for your VR. It's all in one unit, which is is, is what these are, are being billed as. Um, but if if I'm a, a VR fan that, that I clearly am, um, you know, if I have my, my HTC WorldSense unit, and I take it um, like I like last week to Europe with me, you know, on the airplane. I can watch movies and and look like a, a crazy guy on the airplane with a VR headset on. Uh, but then when I get back home, I can plug it into my PC and get the higher performance that that inevitably a, a, a PC is going to give me over or over any kind of integrated. Um, and it lets me, you know, have that without doubling down on lenses and doubling down on HMD. So I really, really, really hope they announce that. But but they haven't yet, and they may be keeping that in their pocket for the future. Yeah, I'm not too sure about that. The way, because the way that would work, it obviously needs some kind of uh, link box, I would imagine, because you'd need to have a HDMI connection, a USB connection, possibly. Um, and these things, I, I don't know where they they would go about that. To me, the way they're positioning this is for users. And actually, I was going to get onto this in a second, but I'll get onto it now because. They seem to be positioning this for users who don't want the hassle. Now, it came out a few or the next day after these were announced that they're probably going to be uh, priced in similarly to the uh, HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift, which at first it might seem a bit of a <laughs> a bit of a problem because obviously they're going to be slightly lower spec, but you're taking the hassle out of everything now. I was I've demonstrated VR to people that I know members of my family and I can imagine a situation where price might not necessarily be a barrier of entry to some people but the hassle if they're not technically minded the hassle of getting a PC and setting it up and maintaining it as well in order to run these VR headsets is a barrier so I think these are really aimed and I'm thinking specifically maybe you know my parents were quite impressed with VR when I when I shown them uh, my VR my Vive but I can't imagine a situation where they would go out and buy a VR-ready PC and a HTC Vive in order to, to run this thing. But if this headset could give them a, a close approximation of what I'm getting on the Vive, then, then this is really aimed at, at those kinds of people. No, I, I agree with you. I do think that that is what they're they're aiming for. And, and I believe that is the correct approach given, you know, all of the things that, that I am constantly maintaining just in, in my personal uh, units. But at the same time, foregoing, like, I, I don't know how they pull it off, uh, but if it's just a display, and I, I, my expectation is that these HMDs have higher resolution than the, the Rift and Vive that's on the market now, and of course, the PlayStation VR. So my expectation is they have higher resolution uh, and that they may e even use a better lens technology or a more refined lens technology as, as economies of scale and, and, and all that takes place. So... If you know, I'm not saying that it would necessarily plug into the PC and use my Vive, uh, my my lighthouses or anything. It would maintain the same. But but yeah, a a link box that's really not that hard to be tethered or 
you know, wireless. Maybe, you know, maybe in a world where we have the wireless connectivity that just when you get, when you're home, you, you have the choice if you have the PC and if you want to be the power user, then, then that's there. That's, again, I, I have no, no way of knowing that that's the direction they're going to take. But I, looking into this, I personally, like, I think that would fit it would it, maybe I'm being selfish, but it would fit my desires quite a bit because I do want portable VR. I don't have a Gear VR. I'm kind of locked into Apple's ecosphere, and I don't have a Gear VR. And you know, I really, really like this idea, and it it, it lets them kind of uh, feed both markets because there's always going to be a segment. Like me personally, I know I'm always going to want some sort of PC-based VR or something powerful, something that, that has the best of the best uh, performance technology available for consumers at, at, at the current time. So um, if it's just purely a portable-only device, it may, while it may open the door and knock down the barriers to the people you mentioned, um, it, it throws up a barrier for consumers like myself. Yeah, no, I, I do agree with you. I think that's the the ideal. If it could do both things, that, that would be perfect. And just going back to an earlier point that you made, um, I, I also believe that uh, inside-out tracking is the way that slowly all of these companies are, are going to move over to is it gets more accurate. There's no reason not to use this kind of technology rather than putting up lighthouses or, you know, the Oculus uh, sensors as well. Um, and actually going back to another point, because... The Vive um, originally, on the prototypes of the Vive, they actually used uh, inside-out tracking. Uh, they had a camera that was stuck to the Vive, and then they had to, in order to do the, the tracking with uh, any degree of accuracy, they had to use uh, April tags that were stuck to the walls of where they, they were developing this technology. So that was the way they were originally thinking about all of, all of this stuff. Um, but just moving on to this, because this is linked to this story as well, um, HTC, we've mentioned, you know, HTC and Lenovo have both been confirmed as using uh, this WorldSense technology in order to produce the, their standalone headsets. Um, HTC did announce that, they're, or Google announced on HTC's behalf that they'll be releasing a standalone headset that will be released later this year. And one point on this is that they've, they're using the three degrees of freedom uh, daydream controller in conjunction with this with this uh, headset. So that was a, a bit of a question when people were, were looking at this. And, and, you know, we're talking about this very soon after the announcement, and there's been very, very little uh, information really on the specifics of the technology that, that's being used in this. But, but they have confirmed that this existing daydream control is being uh, either packaged or is able to be used with this HTC standalone VR headset. And that that would imply that perhaps the room scalability of this headset isn't quite up there to the level of the Vive, even though it might use some kind of inside out tracking. Um, Steve, what did you think of this HTC, this specifically this HTC headset? You know, I don't have a lot of specific thoughts on it because we don't know too much. Uh, other than you know the aforementioned point of of including the the three um, uh, degrees of freedom controller, but at the same time, you buy an Oculus Rift today, and it includes a a similar kind of controller. It's really just more or less a like a pointer that lets you, uh, if you're playing or going to watch something like Henry or Lost, it lets you start it without you know needing a a more elaborate controller. Um, so this may be kind of in that space. Um, you know, kind of. I don't think the inclusion of that controller establishes with any degree of certainty that the headset will be limited to 3DOF, um, but, but it might. I mean, it's we, we have the, the news uh, marshals to nibble on that we have, and, you know, right now it's that it, it kind of suggests that that may be the case. So we really have to wait for, for more info to come out. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to mention because I didn't immediately think that, that the inclusion of that controller with this headset would mean that the headset itself didn't have six degrees of freedom or anything like that. But I was reading an article that was on Upload VR. So they mentioned that this point this strongly implies. I don't necessarily get that impression. It could still use this controller, as you say, just as a uh, some kind of input. It doesn't necessarily matter that it's only three degrees of freedom. So HTC's headset could possibly still have six uh, six degrees of freedom we don't know yet but uh yeah um okay we can 
move on to the next news story, which is again a Google related news story from IO. And I this one stuck out to me. I, I've put this in the news list because this was interesting to me. People were talking about how Google were going to announce some kind of technology that would um allow for higher fidelity graphics on mobile platforms. And this came about in the form of a piece of I presume software technology called uh, Surat, um, which they've described as a tool that can render high fidelity desktop level graphics on mobile VR platforms. Um, Steve, did you see this one? Yeah, I, I did, and I watched the uh, little video that was included in the upload article, and it's it's impressive. And you know, they didn't really spell out, um, at least that I could see, exactly how they were able to accomplish that. Um, but it's this is the type of, of evolution in technology that is going to to push this forward. Uh, it, we, that's going to push VR as a, as a whole forward because we are, we're all craving that that fidelity uh, without it looking like a uh, like a blurry mess. You know, going back to um, say Resident Evil 7, still my favorite game, everyone. Um, it 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 had it was running on the PlayStation and I, I was playing on a pro which is comparatively underpowered even the pro but it it had a the art style I could tell was was very realistic but it was kind of covered a little bit by uh, some some aliasing issues and, and and some things and if if they could have used a technology like this it could have dramatically improved the Resident Evil experience. And there are other games, like the another one that comes to mind is First Contact. Uh, again, it, it, it kind of has that, um, for lack of a, a better way to describe it, that sort of realistic, the the either the light sources and the, and the textures, it just has a sort of a realistic look. And, and this is what I think um, is gonna apply here. I, I've, I've talked in the past how I've been a, um, for whatever reasons, I'm drawn to cartoony type experiences, and I think it's because they look so good, and you, you're not constantly served with distractions that that say, "Okay, well, that that wood table, um, it isn't real because they're trying to make it look real, but it it, it shimmers and it has all these aliasing problems that it it, it kind of pulls you out of the experience, and and the cartoony ones don't don't have that problem per se." So, so this type of uh, technology and, and some of the video, some of the, the content they showed, uh, this is in, I don't know if it's in partnership and, and to what degree, but I know uh, ILM uh, X Labs, the people who did the uh, Tatooine uh, trials on Tatooine uh, Star Wars experience, um, they're, they're, they've at least used this and, and have, have, have been working uh, with it. And they've, they've showed an, an impressive uh, scenery in, in the video on the upload article. And it, if it does what they say, it's, it's one of those things we can't really uh, demonstrate it. We, we almost have to take them at face value because we're just looking at a video and an article. And it's like, yeah, this, this was um, the powerful rendering that took like an hour for every two minutes of video or, or whatever to render and then after running it through this technology now we can render that same scene in 13 uh, milliseconds uh, we we can't see how true that is we can only take them for their word uh, but it still um, sounds sounds awesome and um, you know kind of on that point is with this real-time video like I don't I don't know how true this is but I've heard that when um, uh, Pixar, Disney, Pixar, when when they create a a film, when they do their initial rendering, that it takes massive amounts of of uh, server farm type processing power to crunch each second worth of of uh, of uh, final rendered video, and if if that's what it's going to take to to do these computer aided graphics, any improvement, you know, when when you're watching a, a movie, it's it's already been pre rendered. You don't have to to render it. Uh, but when you're playing a game, some elements of it, or if not the entirety of it, needs to be rendered in real time. Because if you bend down to look under a table or look around the corner, it it's got to render that in real time. So improvements here is 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 really a big deal. And uh, I I just love reading and seeing about stuff like this because I know it's going to push the industry forward. Yeah. I agree. I think um, that the focus on optimization of all of these um, experiences using various forms of technology is definitely a great way to go. 
what they said with this as well when they demonstrated a scene um at google i o um they said that the the scene that they demonstrated originally contained fifty million triangles, and using this uh Suat technology, they converted the scene to seventy two thousand triangles, which obviously reduces the amount of processing power required by the p c to to uh, to process this scene. And there was no loss of fidelity at all in that. And I saw the same video as you did um, from this. And, and they don't explicitly say how they, they achieved this, but the implication from this video seems to be that they're rendering a scene and then uh, sort of ignoring the polygons that are not actually immediately viewable to the user. They're sort of looking at the point of view of where the user is and then just completely uh, removing all the polygons that are not uh observable in that particular moment and you know I, I i don't know exactly how it works but that seems to be more or less how that how they're able to do something like this i'm sure it's a lot more complicated than that but um the, the this direction that they're going in and, and achieving all of these things to improve the fidelity within vr which is one of the main things that people notice when they go into virtual reality for the first time um, a lot of people will say how it's low resolution and it just doesn't look great. Uh, personally, when I went into VR for the first time, I, I was actually quite impressed because I'd heard so many stories about how how low resolution it was that it actually impressed me that it was much higher than I expected. But um, yeah, anything we can do to increase the resolution is is going to be great. And like you say, this uh, industrial light, light and magic uh, demo, they've been given some uh, this technology a while ago in order to produce some something with it. So I don't know how that will turn out, but we'll it, I'll be very interested to see that. Um, the next news story that we can talk about, and this was uh, something that was quite important for Vive owners and also Oculus Rift owners, because Steam VR Home Beta was announced. Which um, what they did is, if if you want to try this, I'll, I'll just explain because you can uh, subscribe. Uh, sort of uh, download the beta branch of Steam VR through uh, Steam and then you're able to give this a try and Steam VR home beta is an area where you can launch games uh, similar to how it is at the moment using the compositor but it's much more uh, it's it's got much more functionality to it and what it, they said is it allows a richer more intera interactive and more social experience than the existing launch area and I went into this last night actually um uh, just very briefly, just to, to give it a try. Now, what they've done, they've sort of incorporated the, uh, parts of Destinations, or in fact, all of Destinations into this. And this allows you to have environments around you, walk, uh, teleport around, and also interact with some of your friends on Steam within a virtual reality space before you're even in any uh, experience or game. So it's I'll be honest, this is something that I sort of expected from the start. Before I got virtual reality, I sort of expected this kind of thing to, to be the case. But obviously, it wasn't there, and they had a lot to develop in order to get to this point. But I tried it, as I say, and it was uh, pretty good. I don't know. I've not given it enough of a chance to really get into it in any big way. I don't know exactly what you can do in there other than what I've tried. But, Steve, have you had a chance to try this yet at all? Yeah, I checked it out earlier today, and... It's an improvement. Um, I'm not sure if they're they're trying to kind of go at it from a uh, a Facebook Spaces uh, kind of approach or not. Um, it, it doesn't seem to be f hitting that same uh, target. Um, so then maybe they're not going that. But but in terms of just a sort of a launch pad environment, um, it to me is a big improvement. Uh, that initial environment that you load into when you when you open it for the first time, the kind of the uh, the house or it's really just a room, uh, but a room that opens up to a deck that's kind of up on a, on a mountain scene. Um, I really liked it a lot. And previously I've been using a um, Super Mario 64 uh, in front of Peach's Castle. Uh, so the, the, the scene looks good. The, um, it's it's really an overhaul to me. It looks like an overhaul of, of just how you interact uh, with Steam from within VR. Um, 
and you, it seems to be that there's a multiple ways of, of interacting. You have um, in, in this one particular environment, which is the default one, uh, you have sort of the big screen on the wall to your right. You can hit a power button on it and uh, some sort of community related items show up. You can see some screenshots, you can see uh, some other environments that you can download. Uh, but then you have the three smaller screens or panels that are directly in front of you. And you, there's different interactivity there, but there's also some overlap between the two. So in the end, it just, it, it initially right now, it just looks like an improvement uh, just to an environment and from an interact interactivity standpoint, which uh, to me is, is a big improvement. Uh, I know there's possibly some, uh, I believe I've seen uh, some video or screenshots of some social aspects, uh, but but maybe, maybe I'm mis misstating, so I, I don't wanna be too incorrect there. Um, uh, but you can also customize your avatar. So it, I, I know there, if, if social aspects aren't uh, necessarily in, in place now, it, it's just clearly the precursor to that. Uh, and I played around with some of the avatar um, modifications and that's really not my bag. Like I could really care less what my <laughs> VR representation looks like, at least for now when social uh, interactivity isn't a, a huge focal point um, within VR yet yeah, no one has made me and I and I play multiplayer games so it's not like I'm a person that's anti multiplayer uh, but there no one has made an app or a game that makes me feel compelled to constantly be social uh, but if and when that time comes then I guess I'll care more about avatars and all that um, so so again my long-winded uh, summarized conclusion is, is basically I think this is a major improvement to steam VR interactivity and I also checked it out with a rift and it works fine with a rift as well so they, they've done a good job with their cross compatibility Compatibility. Yeah, I've seen some videos of people using it with the Rift, and it seems to work absolutely perfectly within that as well. So that's all good news. But um, it does have some social elements. When I tried it yesterday, I tried it for about 30 minutes, and um, you're able to go, uh, create your own rooms, but also go into other people's rooms, and it shows you a list. You've got the main screen over to your right when you start this, but then you've got the three smaller panels, as you say. Now, the left panel, it contains some uh, lists of rooms that are open to the public. So you can go in and it tells you how many people are currently in each room. And you can go in and talk to people within there. So it does have some social element already built into it. I didn't really use that. I didn't really explore that aspect of it. But you can also customize your home area, I believe. Um, I've not done anything to do with this at all in the 30 minutes that was I, in there. I've done so in in that default uh, environment you can change the some of the furniture that's in that that first room the one open room and then the statue or the area for the statue and the garden I think they call it the garden out that's right outside the door you can customize um, what's there and you have um, only like three or four options each so it's not like there's a, a myriad of, of customizations and it's not like you can um, place furniture where you want it to be and things like that yet but I, I imagine that's only going to come uh, and then i also downloaded the um there was an environment that i don't remember seeing before um it's it's sort of a uh, cartoony uh, wayward sky looking environment you're, you're sort of out at sea and you're on this uh, uh, kind of wooden dock platform and it's a house and you got uh, whales that are flying yeah i saw the, that one as well yeah yeah, uh, I, I download it because it's really easy. They've, they've done a good job making the environments just like show up in a list, click, uh, you hit click subscribe, which is interesting. You don't click download, you click subscribe, I guess, which suggests that any updates to the environment would be pushed down to your system. Uh, but you just click subscribe and then you can bounce between environments pre pretty quickly. And um, so I, I checked that one out and I thought that one looks pretty cool. It seems to have a little less uh, functional utility, uh, you know, it just kind of is more just kind of not necessarily chaotic, but uh, doesn't seem to make sense in the same way that the default uh, environment does. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's it's a big improvement. And you know, likewise, I've talked about in the past um, the Open VR Advanced Settings, which was a a downloadable install tool that uh, you can install on your PC, and then it gives you a tab um, within the Steam VR menu when you press the menu button on your Vive or um, this the opposite menu button on your Rift, because if you press the main one, it just launches the Rift menu. Uh, but when you, either or, um, the OpenVR advanced 
settings is a, um, a, a tab in there. Uh, so the developer of that has updated it. So along with this change uh, to the Steam VR Home, uh, Valve has made it so that uh, your super sampling adjustment can be on the fly and doesn't require a, a restart. Now, some games will still require the restart, but um, uh, I, uh, in fact, I'd imagine most games still require a restart. Uh, but it's still, that's open VR advanced settings. It lets you access all, access all of that from within the headset. And it's been already updated uh, that quickly by the user. And I didn't write uh, that person's name down, so I'll have to give him credit later. Um, but they, they've already updated it. Um, so which is which is excellent and I played with that and uh, it looks good and then also one other change to super sampling is that they are now doing a um, they've changed what the numbers mean um, and it, it's they're intending for it to make more sense now, the problem is we we now have um, I don't know 10 11 months so of, of super sampling experience with the vibes so all of us that have been doing it for a while are having to retrain our brains, I guess, so to speak. But now with the number, if you put a, a 2.0 in there, uh, what that number now means is it's two times the width, two times the height. Um, and before, that, I think that equated to right around a 1.4. Yeah, I think what, what it is, actually, what they're saying is if you put in a 2.0 two, 2 now, it means that they've got two times the amount of pixels. Uh, so it's not four times as it was previously. It's now two, uh, twice as many pixels. Um, but yeah, the, what it is, if you've already been super sampling as well, they can, they'll automatically transfer over. So you don't need to worry about it too much. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a little bit confusing, as you say, because everybody's got used to super sampling and what the, all the numbers seem to mean. But this, uh, so I, I was previously super sampling at 1.2 on the old system. Now that translates to a 1.44, actually, to be exact, because somebody actually made on Reddit, somebody made a uh, translation uh, graph for, for you, so you can uh, check that out. But uh, it should do it automatically anyway. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's that's there. So uh, while I'm not sure the they should have necessarily changed the numbering. The fact that Valve is looking at this and giving it official support, uh, over there on the Oculus side, there is no official support. Now, likewise, there is a, a user-created utility called Oculus Tray Tool uh, that works really well, and it has um, one feature that I'd like to see on the, on, on the Steam side, um, in that you can assign a super sample by application. Uh, of course, you know, you, you kind of have a default, which is where I keep mine at uh, 1.3, I think. And then, you know, some games run better or worse. But um, still, the, the improvements there suggest that Valve is, is taking an active approach with it and something that I very much welcome in that regard. Yeah, I was wondering because a lot of people were sort of requesting this per application super sampling setting for quite a while. And now that we've got this uh, ability to super sample on the fly without restarting every time, I'm wondering if the guy who made uh, OpenVR ad advanced settings is able to somehow incorporate that into that program at a later date as well, even if uh, Steam. Can't. You know, I would I almost wonder if, if there's something within Steam VR that makes that difficult. Because of that, I would think that that is like checkbox numero uno uh, to 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 get working because it's such a popular request that there there is maybe some sort of barrier or something just fundamental in the way Steam VR works that that they can't pull that off. Uh, but still, I, I hope it comes. But at the same time, it's kind of counter to you know what we started the the show with today is we're looking for easier, we're looking for simpler, yeah. we're looking for things that that consumers want to just pop a headset on and go, and and you know to to really have the minutiae management of of setting super sample levels for each app is kind of counter to where I think the industry wants to be. Although me personally, uh, that's what I want. That's it. There's a certain subset of people that absolutely want that. They want to delve into Steam VR and, and get every little tiny ounce of performance out of that, um, no matter what, no matter how much work it takes. And I'm probably caught somewhere between the two worlds, really. I, I don't I don't want to go overboard with this kind of stuff. But at the same time, I do. I, I think super sampling does such a great job of improving the experience um, in a lot of applications if your PC can handle it. Um, yeah, so 
that's pretty much it for Steam VR Home Beta. Um, yeah, download that, get onto the uh, beta branch of Steam VR, and you can try that out. Um, it's I don't know about you, actually. I'll, I'll ask you, Steve. Did you have any performance issues at all? I noticed very, very slightly when I went in, there was a little bit of uh, judder. Yes, I, I definitely saw Judder, and and I wouldn't even describe it as as a little. Uh, at first, when it, while it was loading, it was it was quite bad, uh, but then it kind of settled down. I'm like, oh, okay, I was just loading for the first time. Who knows what it was doing? And um, but then occasionally, I would get just like a, a freeze uh, for I don't know a quarter of a second or so. But it was enough that it was. I, I'm I'm not even sure that's Judder. It was like a flat out freeze, and which was kind of. Um, not very pleasing uh but you know it's they just launched it you know i'll give them a lot of slack when it comes to something like that so that doesn't bother me too much but it does also feel like i don't know if they made efficiency improvements to uh what they call the i guess the compositor you know you have the application super sampling and the compositor super sampling but to me it feels like all the text is sharper like it auto translated um where i had the compositor set uh, prior to um, steam vr home uh, but it just all the text just seems so much sharper and I, I don't know if somewhere during the conversion something got mismanaged and and my maybe my super sampling is too high uh, and I need to adjust it but it's um, it, it looked really damn good um, really good but but I had performance issues so we'll give them some time to settle that out and see where that goes yeah I didn't notice that myself but uh, I'll check that because this past week I've been really really busy to be honest so I've not done a great deal of VR the same as, as uh, the week before that unfortunately but um, yeah so I, I want to after I finish finish the show actually I want to go back in and uh, play around with it a little bit more anyway the other two I mean that's the main news stories that we had this week um, but I've just wanted to mention a couple of others that I found quickly these are the fact that Samsung Galaxy S8 is now getting daydream support which um, makes sense because it's it's powerful Android phone which uh, could technically support daydream but obviously it's uh, tied to the gear VR platform in, in some way as well so that was just an interesting bit of news and you know, we've mentioned it before, and and all this news that came out of Google I/O with um, these uh, mobile headsets, these standalone headsets, it just makes me want uh, a headset that can just carry around with me. You know, I could take into the lounge or uh, take up somewhere else in the house that I can use, or even take around around a friend's house or, or a family member's house just to give them a try as well. And the more I see stuff like this especially as we get into the advent of standalone headsets coming out with inside out tracking the more i'm considering jumping on one of these platforms and you know at the moment i guess the premier platform for mobile vr is the gear vr um i think from all the reports i've seen it's slightly better than daydream at the moment so that would probably be the one steve i know you like me you're you're an iphone user does this kind of stuff make you want to switch over to android <sighs> Yeah, it, it it does, but not not enough because I know that the experience is gonna be rightfully so, but watered down compared to my Vive and my Rift, and I, I don't I don't want to be caught making such a big change to only find myself uh, mildly amused for a few weeks and then sort of regretting it later. Um, I'd love an opportunity to, to sort of just sample one. And I don't mean at a Best Buy because I've played with the Gear VR at a, at, at a Best Buy and it, it, you can't really get the full experience there because right? you know, you're, you're limited to what things they have on it. And you know, you, the idea of, of completely blocking off my field of view in a store um, <laughs> with all kinds of people around me is just kind of like, eh, I'm just, yeah. can, you never get comfortable. Um, so I'm not sure that that is as is, is much of a, of a valid trial. So yeah, I'm very interested, but I, I, I've not been even close to compelled to, to make a switch yet. Um, so, you know, hopefully Again, it kind of goes back to my earlier point. Like, if if they can give me the best of both worlds with a single HMD, then I will make that hop instantly. Yeah, I'm the same way as you, really, because I feel like I really do want to try mobile VR and I want to get my own, you know, phone that can do this kind of stuff. But everything is moving so quickly in VR, especially that you, you as soon as I was to get a, a Galaxy S8, if I was to go that route, then you know. 
a few months down the line, they're going to iterate on this in on the Daydream platform, for example. Um, and you just feel like you're going to be left behind. I'm, I'm going to be tied into a, a two-year contract. Um, and there's ways out of that, obviously. But at the same time, I don't want to make this jump. What I'm going to do, actually, is you know in september or october apple will probably announce their next phone and hopefully they'll announce something that uh, will work with the iphone that's i mean that's what everyone's waiting for i guess but that's probably what i'm going to do um and the la the very last thing I, I had this week is just the a little news story actually that I, I found not long before we came on but this is the oculus home um on gear vr actually runs three times faster um, by using a software framework called React VR. And this ties into something that we mentioned a few weeks ago. Uh, John Carmack was working on uh, a slightly different rendering, uh, a way, way of rendering the uh, home on the Gear VR, which made it twice run twice as fast and also you know, a, a higher resolution as well. So this ties into that. Now, this was just something I wanted to mention. I don't know a lot about it, but this React VR is used uh, primarily to build web VR content. But they're using this software framework to enhance the performance of Gear VR, which, again, ties into something we were talking about originally, where all of these innovations in terms of technical performance of VR headsets seems to be moving very clearly in one direction. Everybody's trying to get every ounce of performance out of all of these VR headsets. Um, I don't know if you saw this, Steve, um, and you know we've already mentioned this, so I don't know if you've got anything to add to well, that. No, initially I didn't see it, but while you were talking, uh, I, I pulled it up and, and gave it a quick glance over because you know, when you said three times faster, my my gut reaction was, what the hell does three times faster mean? Is it is it running 270 frames per second? Or I, I don't know what the Gear VR nominal frame rate is, maybe 60. You know, is it running 180 frames a second? Um, and it looks like it is a, uh, it's a 30% power savings on your phone, which I imagine is a huge deal um, because people are constantly managing battery life. Um, but that it also boots up three times faster, and, and I think maybe I, I, I don't I don't see any reference to um, the actual in-app or in uh, experience performance being um, any faster. But there is okay. going back to that Carmack point though, where he was able to um, use the his um, cleverness to effectively double the resolution. Um, you know, so 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 that's there. I I I, I did. <laughs> I think it's I think it's some marketing speak <laughs> right? like it's you know uh, yeah. third, three times faster that's kind of almost it's almost clickbaity uh it, yeah which, it <laughs> it is uh, the only thing the only thing is the the reason i wanted to mention that is because it sort of ties back to some of this other stuff how they're you know the uh surat uh technology that, that google yeah. are using i think it's it's just interesting because what we all want is we don't want to keep upgrading our pcs <laughs> to get better performance and what i'd rather have is some kind of clever software solution to this kind of stuff um that can make the performance in vr headsets even in the generation the next generation where we've got higher resolution in the headsets sets themselves where we don't have to constantly keep upgrading our PCs as well in order I mean I'm sure there'll be a, a, a part of that because everybody as we lower the, the performance required for PC then they'll just push it further and further in terms of rendering but at the same time I, I, I just found this interesting anyway just in terms of where it's going yeah yeah no you're, you're absolutely right because the, the 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 whole space like this is a a very interesting time and, and it's not that VR hasn't been interesting this whole time it, it has been but now so many people are getting on board and we're getting new stories new HMDs you know up until well still right now you, you have the big three but I believe that um, plus gear VR I, I believe that that is going to get muddled a little bit and at some point hopefully sooner than later the headset is just going to be like a TV or a monitor it is decoupled from your your ecosphere that that you you know whether that be Steam or or, or whatever. Uh, very similar to how consoles and and PC uh, traditional uh, flat pancake gaming is. You you go out and buy whatever TV you want. You go out and buy whatever mouse and keyboard you want. And 
I, I want the HMDs to, to, to get there. And, and it's, it's, it's going that direction. You know, you have, um, you know, what we talked about earlier, the, the Google world sense, you know, it's going to be an HTC unit, a Lenovo unit, uh, Microsoft holographics, you know, they got Acer, Lenovo, and however many was announced. I can't even think of them all Dell, I think. So you're going to have that. And I think, that is going to help in conjunction with with your point. And this is where, where I'm going with it. All the advancements now that now that you have so many different people, so many different companies involved, you're going to get a um, sort of a free market, uh, not, but not for money uh, or an economy, but but in terms of technology. You know, everybody's going to want to trademark, patent, and copyright uh, their 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 intellectual property. But at the same time, through the like the Kronos Alliance, they're going to want to improve we're going to push the field further and and that's the real exciting stuff because this is how we knock off all that low-hanging fruit uh to make vr more acceptable and more appealing to the mainstream which is what we need you know all the the what did i say um uh, the neo gaff naysaying naysayers or, or whatever i call them that, that group <laughs> over there uh they they have lists of oh, VR can't succeed because of X, Y, and Z. Well, we can improve on X, Y, and Z, and we will improve on X, Y, and Z. And having more genius people at, at, at all these different companies working on X, Y, and Z will, will help us get there. And it will also flesh out, you know, um, one person's or one company's solution to a problem. Uh, sorry, I keep hitting my mic stand. One person's solution to a problem and another person's, you know, they will they will compete again sort of in a free market way and i i just it's it's very exciting times and it's moving very fast and it, it makes it hard to want to jump in on any hardware it does yeah that's a good point actually it's something i think about all the time i'm so pleased that i picked up my vive and i i love it and but at the same time you're constantly aware of iterations that are coming out it's constantly on these websites where they're talking about the, the next headset that's coming out variations on the headset you've already got even um but at the same time that's the way it's going to go and that's the only way it's going to get good and get more people on board um but yeah the, anyway that's uh, pretty much all the news i've got this week have you got anything else you wanted to add before we get on to what we've been playing uh no uh, okay. th there, there was, there was one, but uh, I guess we're gonna withhold. Uh, do you know what I'm referring to? Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> okay, we, can, yeah. we can, we can, we can mention it if you want to talk about that. Oh, eh, what the hell? Um, so you know, upload VR. Uh, they've, they've been uh, sort of hit with a scandal, and recently, we uh, Magic Leap was also hit with a scandal that I believe they've settled out of court. And, and, and both of these scandals are, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not reading from anything and I don't have any notes, uh, but both of these scandals were very um, political sort of in, in nature. They, they deal with uh, equality for, for women and just, you know, people being decent. And, and I, don't, I don't really want to get into that aspect of it, uh, but what I found interesting, and, and again, going back to the turds over at NeoGAF, they... They one of their mods actually had had made a, a forum post and I was referencing the upload VR uh, scandal specifically, but but also made reference to the Magic Leap, and there there was commentary that kind of said, yeah, what's up with all these VR companies acting this way? What what is it about VR people that acts this way? And and I thought that was such crap. Like there 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 are assholes everywhere there are people that that do bad things everywhere for every company you whatever your favorite company is they're they're misogynistic homophobic uh racist or prejudiced people that's that's the way it is and there's no excuse for it and it shouldn't be tolerated but that doesn't speak for the whole company now if if what in the upload vr segment is true what makes that a little different is that from what i gather it's the owners and some of the uh upper executives that that are behaving this way so that's very different than um you know someone on the lower end of the employment scale behaving this way who doesn't necessarily speak for the the company uh these two guys clearly do speak for upload vr so and again i don't i don't want to get into the the um the philosophy or, or the politics of it, but I, I felt it was worth bringing up, and especially since we um, here on VR Roundtable we didn't talk about the Magic Leap scandal. I, I don't think we're interested in discussing scandals, but kind of want to maybe address the elephant in the room 
yeah. if it's that and, and at least acknowledge it that we know it's out there but we don't want to i guess muddy down and 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 um you know run the risk of pissing someone off by commenting on on the 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 actual details themselves no i mean the the point to make is this is news that came out in the last week so we do a news show we we need to bring it up and it's important news that the community has been talking about the vr community so um we wanted to mention it i, I guess uh, but yeah it's an allegation at the moment and we don't know really where it's going it's coming from some former employees who used to work at upload vr and we don't know exactly the ins and outs of it so we can't really comment on this so it, we'll see what happens and where it goes but what I will say is just even having allegations like this out there, it's it's detrimental to upload VR, whether these allegations are true or not. I think it does affect the way that you look at them. You know, you've got to try and be a little bit intelligent about this and say, you know, nothing's been proven. This is just an allegation, some allegations that have been made and we can't judge it yet. But, you know, we're all human and, and it does affect the way you look at certain things. Um, so you just have to try and, take that on board and hopefully um we'll, well we'll see what happens we don't know what's going to happen with this but uh, we'll probably mention it again at some point in the future uh, well, you know you know the community needs a trial to uh replace the trial of the century with the <laughs> Zenimax versus oculus yeah. so uh yep yeah. okay uh you want to get into what you've been playing yeah, I'll go first only because I've I've not got a great deal, and I know you, we you've got a bigger title that you can talk about this week. So I'll just mention because Smashbox Arena is actually uh, it's, they've got a free weekend going on this weekend, and this is a title which I hadn't played before. Although I know that it had got a, quite a positive reception when it was first released. It's a multiplayer arena shooter, and um, you're, it, it, it's very well polished. Um, this is the first thing I noticed about it. The graphics are very good. Uh, excellent uh, presentation in this game. And it's also got a nice tutorial to get you into it. I mean, in all honesty, the game itself, the multiplayer game itself, is very, very simple. But the tutorial just... just uh, does take you through all the basics of this. There's certain things uh, your gun can fire, certain weapons that you can pick up, and it just explains all this very clearly to you. So when you go into your first multiplayer map after uh, going through the tutorial, you really do feel like you know what you're doing in, in a weird way, even though it's the first time. And I played this last night, and i got to say, I, I did enjoy it. Um, I'm not too sure if I'd pick it up um, after this, mainly because I'm not really a multiplayer kind of guy, but I did enjoy the three matches that I played last night. And I did quite well, actually. <laughs> I was quite pleased with how, how I did, which was unexpected, because I'm not very good at multiplayer games at all. But... There's something about this that uh, it's very addictive. You know, you you want to keep playing. It's one of these ones. There was something very similar, like um, in Rec Room, when they first brought out Paintball in Rec Room. I went into that and I tried it, and I wasn't expecting too much, even though a lot of people were, were raving about it. Because I don't really like multiplayer games, I didn't expect to enjoy that. But I did enjoy it, and this had a very similar feel to that. Um, although I will say this one grabbed me even more than Paintball. Um, and the good thing about this is when you get eliminated from the match in this game, you become sort of like a, a huge invisible giant where you can look over the map and observe other people playing uh, the multiplayer game. And this is actually very good on a number of levels. First, first of all, it's good just on an aesthetic level. It looks great when you're this giant and you can move around, you can rotate the map and see where everybody's hiding and, and this kind of stuff. But it also helps you out in your multiplayer game as well because you can see some of the techniques that other players are using, uh, both on your team and on the other team. Uh, um, but yeah, I, I did enjoy that part and I did enjoy the game. Again, I've not played it a great deal, but I'm definitely going to be trying this. I think there's a few hours left on it tonight that I can uh, get into this. Well, it's free for the weekend, so maybe it's also free tomorrow. Or you're just talking about your available time to play it. Um, yeah. Do you know how much it cost? Because the, the game was recently announced as coming to the PlayStation VR as well. Oh right, okay. I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. But over, I mean, on Steam, it costs eighteen pounds ninety nine over here in the UK, so around twenty five dollars. Okay, yeah. Um, so like, it's a like, I'm 
I would say between you know you and Anthony and and maybe Chris, I, I don't know his taste as, as well as I do you guys, but I'm probably the one in the group that is more into multiplayer, and you know I played a ton of rigs um, and uh, I've gotten into Starblood Arena and with this game, I'm curious because I haven't played it and I'm glad you bring it up because I want to go play it and I almost would have forgotten that it was free this weekend. Is how is the locomotion like? That's if it's teleport based, that's kind of you know, and I never really, I never honestly, I never gave paintball a try in Rec Room. <laughs> I always kept forgetting and never went back to it. And I, I know at some point, I believe it was teleport based. Uh, so, so how is Smashbox? Is it teleport? It is teleport. What, what the way it works is you will throw a, like a, a small device out into the distance, and then after a few seconds, you'll teleport there. I believe. I mean, I guess the the reason they've made it so it's not instant teleport is so that you can't just constantly be moving, teleporting around the map, um, appearing one, in one place and then immediately teleport out. You have to be in one position for at least a few seconds, and this can affect the way that you play. And you know, you, there's a certain amount of time, even when you've decided where you want to teleport to next. You there's a certain amount of time that you have to wait before you appear there. So it it's different to paintball in that respect, and it does affect the way you play the game. Okay, so um, I don't know if you've been able to check out Dead and Buried, but but it's another one in that vein. You can't teleport around, so their mechanics in that game they set it up so that you have a lot of cover. When you die, you spawn in a certain fixed location, and it's uh, room scale supported enough to a degree that you can move to the side, but you can't really you know locomote across the map or something like that. Uh, so uh, teleportation and and how they pull that off in a what what is effectively a shooter uh, is, is very important, uh, but something else that stood out to me in your description, and you know, and, and only because it's the two of us, and we can kind of talk a little differently here than when we have the full crew. But you said that after you you, you die, uh, you become a giant, and yeah. I, I found that very curious. Do you physically like? Do you are do you see your body and arms, or is uh, it just a camera perspective? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sorry, I should have been a bit clear. Yeah, you're not. No, no, it's it's, um, it's fine. And the reason why I I, um, I found that interesting because uh, a month or so ago when we were talking about Kronos, uh, it was either you or Anthony had said that, uh, well, you're like a ghost in this game. You know, you're, you're it's third person, and you're like in a corner of a room as a ghost. And really, there's no indication that that in terms of narrative or in terms of physical embodiment that you're a ghost. And I just, I find it a sort of a philosophical type uh, uh, interest in the sense that for, for you uh, and, and I'm only, I'm not saying right or wrong. Uh, it's, it's not one of those kind of things, but for you w within virtual reality, you kind of just uh, nominally assign a, a embodied perspective to things. Whereas yeah. for me, I don't do that. And I think it's very interesting. I could just think of it as, as just, just perspective, like, Oh, this is a camera perspective. And I don't know if it's because I've played a lot of PlayStation VR. So it's, it's a little more tethered from that first person perspective a lot or, or what it is. But I just, I, I thought it was a very interesting point and I don't want to harp on it too much. No, it's, again, it. it's not a right or wrong thing, but it's, it's, it's very, it's very neat. Like, cause people's minds think differently. That's a good point, actually, that you bring up, because as well, when I was thinking about describing that part of this, I was having trouble actually coming up with the words of, of how to describe yourself within that. But you are, I mean, you're a giant only because everything else shrinks down and you're a silent observer on, on the match that's taking place. But yeah, it's a good point that you raise because I, I, I didn't think about that. And, and now you mentioned the fact of Cronus and how... Anthony, I guess, uh, described you as, as a ghost. It's it it sort of rings true in different ways that um, I can say that because w when I was talking about this just a second ago, I just said I was a giant, and you can view the map. That would that would imply that you are do have some kind of a body and some kind of presence in the map as well, whereas you really don't in this. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, there's so much, and, and I don't know why I I get hyper focused on 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 really 
semantics, but at the same time, I'm not sure that they are semantics because you hear so much about how uh, some VR consumers, they can't play seated games or they can't play controller based games. Um, and then, and likewise, people that prefer seated or, or gamepad type games, you know, that they could be critical of motion and say, well, I don't want to be standing up and, and pantomiming a, a barbarian swinging a sword. Uh, it's silly. You know, it, there's, there's very opposing uh, viewpoints. And I think I think it all comes down to the root of our each of our individual perspectives, and um, just being cognizant of that I think is critical in 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 kind of fighting not fighting but just existing within this dueling uh, world of VR of, of opposing viewpoints. So it's I'm just sure, interesting. Yeah, I'm sure this is the kind of uh, discussion that developers have amongst themselves as well when they're designing certain games. Yeah, I can only imagine. Uh, but with that out of the way, I'm going to go ahead, uh, if you're done, and I'll start talking about the game I've been playing. Uh, this is the big release this week, uh, Farpoint on PlayStation VR with the uh, the new AIM controller. And unfortunately, uh, no, not unfortunately, I was in Europe uh, earlier this week when the game came out, so I didn't get to put my paws on it until uh, basically Friday morning, yesterday morning. Uh, so I'm a little bit behind everyone else. But I did get to spend an hour and a half or so with the game and, you know, kind of coming at it backwards, you know, we, we don't do traditional reviews, so to speak, but we still give our opinion on the game. And I'll just say it's a good game. And, and I'll say that the, the aim controller brings a lot of fun and a lot of original uh, elements to it. And I recommend it. Uh, personally, I bought it off of Amazon. It was, um, I can't even remember what retail is on this game, but I think it was maybe $79.99 US and Amazon put it on sale for 60. And because I'm a Prime member, I then got a discount, uh, the, the, the typical Amazon Prime discount that you get on, on new uh, games. And my total out of pocket price for this was 46 USD. And like if you try to buy the, just the game digitally on PlayStation Network, it's $49.99. So I felt like I, for, for $46 that this is an incredible value getting the controller and the game. Um, so I'm going to, as I talk about it, I'll probably be sort of intermixing uh, my my take on the controller itself and the game. They're, they're, they're a combo deal uh, in, in many ways. Um, so the game starts, starts off. It's a very typical sort of uh, space-driven uh, storyline. Uh, it's you're, you're an astronaut and uh, you're you're working in space and you're about to come home because you're always about to come home when something bad happens. And as I said, something bad happens and uh, I'm not sure I could explain what it is. And, and if I could, I, I don't want to get too spoilery, although this happens in the very beginning of the game. Uh, but suffice it to say something bad happens and you end up on this uncharted planet that um, uh, at least uh, the people of earth, assuming that these astronauts are from earth uh, have not, visited this planet and and it's it's just unknown and you get there and there are all of these uh spiders uh you keep calling them spiders they're, they're it's obviously an alien world but it's spider-like creatures and and that runs really into my first critique of the game is there are there there are a differences in enemies so you're not just fighting the the basic uh spiders uh you are they're, they they have different attacks, but they're all it, it, at a crux. They're all spiders, just different forms. They do different things. There's the the kind that hurl uh, ranged attacks at you. They're the kind that get close to you and and effectively melee. And there's big ones and small ones, but they they they're still all spiders. So that's kind of a knock. Uh, but again, the gameplay is different. I just it just seems weird that they couldn't be creative enough to come up with just different creatures to represent those different mechanics. Um, but it, it's only a minor knock. Um, playing with the game, so you locomote using the um, the, the aim controller has both uh, thumbsticks on it. One kind of on the front uh, where, where you would hold your left hand if you're right-handed, and then one on the back. And um, you, you, you operate them the same way you would a, a gamepad game, where uh, the left stick can kind of move, move, move you left and right, forward and backwards, and the right stick can change your perspective. But of course, you can also change your perspective by simply looking because you are in VR. And I haven't experienced any um, 
motion sickness. Uh, even though it's artificial, it feels really good. Holding the the aim controller feels really good. They they did include some uh, configuration that let you change what the right stick or I guess whatever the equivalent of the right stick is, where you can do snap turning or you can do free smooth turning. I have mine set to snap turning, and and the reason for that is. So Farpoint does something that no other PlayStation VR game has done, is if you hold down the options button, you can see uh, very similar to the to in the HTC Vive and on the Oculus Rift, you can see where the camera is within your room. And then it also maps out a, it's, these are hard angles coming from the camera lens. So it's, you don't map it out, but a, a sort of guardian or a uh, chaperone shows up and that's your track space. Uh, and I, I don't know, I'm guessing this isn't a done at the console or the OS level. This is something that the developers of Farpoint have put in. Uh, but I thought that was real interesting. So they show you your track space and they show you the camera. And I think it's because obviously with the single source of tracking, uh, even though the PlayStation camera does have two lenses in it, it does have two cameras, they're so close together, they don't really give you the full depth benefit of having separated cameras. Um, but they, you, at any point, you can quickly uh, gain your reference to, to the camera and um, I have mine set to snap turning so that if I, if I make a turn to go down a different corridor uh, and and I start getting tracking issues and, and it's very real, you'll, you'll find yourself almost fully turned around and then your controller uh, starts wobbling and you have issues and you need to reorient yourself. So it was their way of solving this problem. It isn't perfect and it is emerging immersion breaking, uh, but you know, in, in, room scale on, on the Vive, you know, running into your chaperone is also immersion breaking in, in a similar sense. So um, I set mine to snap turning and I'm able to, to navigate and I've gotten to the point now that if I take a 30 degree or so turn down down a corridor or something, I'll just do it with the snap as opposed to turning my whole body. Um, One thing, sorry Steve, just on that no, point actually, before I, uh, before I ask you questions afterwards, I was just going to mention because coming from the Vive um, and I you know oculus is the same where we have sort of 360 degree uh, sort of room room scale or standing i'm trying to wrap my head around how this game works now now i was under the impression that basically within this game you're moving forward only you don't do you actually turn left and right down different corridors as well or? you you branch um so the game, yeah, you don't really turn around and 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 go back to where you've been, no. um, like n not in a a major locomotive sense. Now, I've I've been in some uh, set point or set piece battles where I have moved backwards while battling and and kind of navigating the terrain. So you can go back, and and there's nothing stopping you from, as far as I could tell, from literally orienting yourself 180 degrees and and walking there uh, but you'll run into tracking issues and I think what they've done is instead of trying to force the issue and 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 trying to artificially uh, limit what you can do they've they've designed the game so that you pretty much only want to go forward uh, but at the same time they've given you a tool so that if you get yourself if your tracking is getting wonky and your 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 gun is flying all over the place um, you can just tap a button and, mm -hmm. and reorient yourself. You don't need to lift your mask. You don't need to do anything. You can you can reorient yourself, and it sounds almost like uh, silly in the sense that if you have a vibe and stuff, because you can always just hit the menu button and see your lighthouses, and you can always gain your perspective. Because even in room scale, sometimes you have to orient yourself. So it was just their solution, and, and they probably borrowed it very heavily from uh, Steam slash HTC in that sense, uh, but it works. And so it's, it's, it's mainly for, I guess, like you've mentioned, just reorientating yourself to so you don't get tracking issues so that you're main, maintaining your point of view directly towards the PlayStation camera, even if you sort of branch off slightly. Yes, uh, but... That. But it's in combination with that and with game design. So it's not it's not truly a sandlot like let's say um, Arizona Sunshine. That's a good example where you may really be pointed at any direction at any time. Uh, Farpoint doesn't work. The game design, although you, there's nothing stopping you from doing it. Like there there are no artificial barriers in place. They've designed the levels. They've designed the missions. They've designed the uh, enemies, the, the creatures you're fighting 
to to kind of steer you to nudge you towards the front and you don't really think about it and i, and I, I don't want to sound like i'm putting the game off by 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 describing it this way it's only in in discussing it with you that that i find myself saying these words because while i'm playing it i'm not like oh i'm only going forward like it, the thoughts really aren't coming uh to me in in that fashion um so uh kind of kind of moving on with the game the controller it it feels good. The triggers feel good. So you have a typical trigger, as you might expect, and that's sort of your main fire. Uh, but on the front, and, and I don't know the, the correct terms. Uh, I'm, I'm not that much of a gun guy. But um, so as you're holding the rifle, you, I'm right-handed. So I, with my left hand, I hold the front portion of the controller. And with my right hand is where I squeeze the trigger on, on the sort of the back side of the controller. And so up there on the front where you have the navigation thumbstick, you have uh, what is L1 and L2, but those are how you'll launch grenades or rockets. It's sort of your secondary fire. And it's it's just very intuitive. Like, you know, you're going and, and I'm walking down a corridor and I'm shooting little spider things with the, the primary ammo. And then a big spider um, will appear and I'll shoot a grenade at it with the grenade launcher. And it all just happens so intuitively. And I've not had a game in VR do that. This controller is, is, is quite fantastic. The problem though, on the downside is it's an accessory for an accessory for a console. <laughs> uh, it's kind of unprecedented, unprecedented in, in, in that space. And uh, the developers of Farpoint, Impulse Gear, have done a good job integrating it into their game, so much so that I couldn't imagine playing this game with a DualShock. And hopefully, I'm hoping that most people have that have picked up Farpoint, uh, picked up the bundle, and, and are playing it with the, the aim controller as opposed to trying to do so with a DualShock. Uh, but they've announced support for Dick Wild, which is a, a, a interesting cartoony wave shooter. I might pick that up just so I can give the aim controller a little more pacing uh, with that. And then I believe Brookhaven Experiment is getting support. I don't think it's been released yet. And uh, it was one more title. I was saying the Sunshine. Yes, Arizona. Well. Yeah, Arizona Sunshine. Well, that game's not out on, on PSVR yet. It seems like it's coming soon, and they've announced aim support. So um, this is sort of like... I want to play all of my shooter games with this aim controller now. So it's kind of a problem. Like now as I go and play something on my Vive or my Rift with uh, with the handheld motion controllers, particularly the Rift, as good as the touch controllers are for shooting a rifle, um, the aim controller is better. Now, tracking problems aside of, of, of having the single source of, of, of tracking, um, it's 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 really fun and they've they've done a really good job with it so i'm very highly recommending the game and again i'm only an hour and a half so so i, I can't really get a feel for for the uh, the value of the game in terms of how long it is uh but the combat's good if you've if you've played arizona sunshine and you like it um then it's kind of it seems similar maybe maybe even a little more narrative driven because there's some cut scenes and things like that um but if if you like uh, a little bit of a narrative around your shooter, um, Firepoint does that, and it, it's a great game. And um, it's kind of like Wilson's Heart. It's I can see myself pretty much playing only it until I wrap it up. It, it's it's put its hooks in me in that sense. That's something I was going to ask you actually, because I know that you and I we're uh, sort of drawn to some narrative games as well that that's really what we want from vr in some respects and i was going to ask you about the narrative is it really drawing you in is the narrative i know from what i've heard about from some reviews it's quite thin and sort of cliche in some places but but has it drawn you in despite Abs that absolutely it's thin uh, that i've seen so far it's cliche as hell uh but it's there and it's competent, which is something that we still don't have in, in most titles. And in a lot of ways, this is a wave shooter, except between waves, you locomote through a terrain and you have cutscenes. Uh, you have voice acting with uh, the, the character that you represent, but uh, also between each level, you'll, um, you'll kind of be back in this, for lack of a better word, this home type area, and you'll get a cutscene to play out. You're, you're the. Um, sort of an observer, a disembodied ghost or giant uh, <laughs> observer that is watching a cutscene between two uh, NPC characters. Um, but and, and that's how they're delivering the story to you. They're trying to drum up, uh, you know, 
care for for you to care about these characters you're giving them you're learning that you know one of them's married and has kids and you know i i I don't know so this isn't a spoiler but i'm guessing she's gonna die or something because they they've made you uh they're trying to develop an emotional attachment and again not a spoiler if that happens it's pure coincidence i'm only speculating based on on how they're treating it um so it's it's again it's it's good and, and I'm recommending it especially if you can pick it up for here in the states for forty six bucks. I don't know if Amazon is still doing their deal. Um, even sixty bucks, I, I think it's it's a it's a no brainer. It's worth having. The other thing I wanted to ask about on this as well because people, you've got the aim control with this game. Does it make a big difference in terms of how you view your hands in VR? Because you've got you've got a, a more accurate representation of the gun that you're holding. Some people who play Onward, for example, I love, I really do enjoy Onward, but they've made these uh, sort of mounts for their Vive controllers, which apparently enhances the experience quite a lot. And I guess this is a similar kind of thing. Yeah, this is like a really, a really good, I think they call them stock. Well, the aim controller doesn't have the stock, which is if you're firing a, a rifle uh, i guess the stock would kind of bred up sort of against your shoulder armpit area um this doesn't have a stock so you're still kind of holding it out more like a submachine gun so it 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 doesn't perfectly um represent what you're seeing because what you're seeing in the game is more of a uh at least the default the first weapon you get is a um assault rifle Uh, and i I have a let's play of it that just went live on on our YouTube channel and I thought it was interesting so on on the assault rifle you have a holographic sight on the top and you can look down the holographic sight and you can line up shots and it it works really well and I what I was expecting is that when I saw myself back when I looked at the let's play I was expecting to see oh I have my aim controller right here I was expecting to see me have the aim controller brought up to my eye but in fact, what I saw was it was much, it was down lower, much like this. So the physical representation of the gun in the game is, is larger than the aim controller uh, is in real life. Uh, but you don't feel it. You don't notice it at all. Like I was completely surprised to realize that I wasn't bringing the controller all the way up to my eye. Uh, one other thing they do is some of the kinematics. So if I take the controller, and, and again, I'm right-handed, and I lift it all the way into the air, it will my left hand in game will detach from it it you just they they just know based on positioning and also if i flip it over and try to look at it from the underside my left hand will detach and then when i bring it in closer to my body my left hand will will, will reattach to it um, so they've given it a sense of of realism and then you can swap so i have two weapons now i have the assault rifle but i also have a shotgun and to swap you just reach over your back with the controller in hand and it'll switch to to the next weapon and the shotgun is different um, but again it doesn't feel detached it doesn't feel like i'm holding this uh cheap light plastic which is what i'm really holding um so so they've done a, a really good job there the last thing I wanted to ask about this, and this is going back to when I saw, because I saw this game demo, I, I, I didn't demo it myself, but I saw this game demoed at an event last year over here in the UK called EGX. Um, now, something that I read online after that event mentioned, let me ask, how's the graphical fidelity, first of all, but also specifically how is did you notice anything to do with the field of view being any smaller in this game than it is in other PSVR games? Because this is a comment that I noticed from some people where they said that they felt like the field of view is being artificially reduced in this game in order to maintain a higher visual fidel- fidelity. Um, but I don't know if that's the case or not. Nobody else has mentioned it since the release, so I don't know if you noticed anything. Well, um, no, I haven't noticed anything, and you know, ignorance is bliss. So now I hope you didn't ruin it for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> next I next so. time I next time I play it, I'm probably going to be looking. Fidelity, though, um, it's not the best. And and again, I'm on the pro, and it it doesn't look bad, uh, but it doesn't look as good as I thought it might. Um, and uh, now some of that is they've they've done a good job giving it a sense of. Uh, space like i feel like i'm on the surface of this planet and when i look out at a canyon or or a thing that's that's often distance it feels right it feels accurate um 
the downside is that some of the textures could could be better um and that, that's not too bad so much from a texture standpoint but what really is the environments and i almost hate to say it but are, are kind of bland like some of it i think they chose to be on this very mars uh like planet is because they could really you're just traversing um deserty red rock sort of terrain and there there's not a lot going on there's no vehicles there's no um there's not a lot of debris or uh things from a civilization uh scattered about the the this planet there are no buildings there are no uh it's really just the rock in the 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 sand and the deserty type uh, mars like environment so that that I think was a design choice so that they could get as much performance as they could out of it. That said, there are a few glimpses of things that look real good. Like the, the second level you'll have, um, as you're traversing, you'll, you'll have this lightning strike that's kind of hitting in the, in the background and it's hitting like this mountain or something. And it just, but it's, um, it's not a lightning strike. Like, like, what we're used to it's kind of very purpley and it's it's bigger and it lasts longer it, it it looked really really cool so so they've done some some good things uh but it it does seem like it's running at a suboptimal resolution you know anthony and and i both talked about how good static looked my guess is static is you know probably two times super sampled whereas uh farpoint is has zero uh super sampling to, to any degree it's just purely native or maybe even sub native uh because the aliasing and stuff it looks softer than i'd like yeah yeah well either way i'm uh, i'd like to give that game a try at some point in the future when i do finally pick up a psv no it it's it's tons of fun and it, it makes me want um a control a a similar controller for for the pc vr and, and again it all goes back to this you know everyone having their own tracking solution and, and cross compatibility i think in the future you know hopefully three years or so from now this isn't a thing you know in 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 out tracking is standard and you know controllers can can take advantage of that so hopefully who knows yeah, yeah you never know okay well we've been going on a little bit longer than we expected to here but um have you got anything else you wanted to add before I close the show, Steve? Nope. Okay. Well, that was uh, VR Roundtable episode 36. Uh, thanks for joining us. And please comment on the uh, below the video. And uh, also you can download the audio version of this podcast on iTunes, uh, Stitcher, and hopefully everywhere else. If anybody is having any problems getting hold of the audio version of this podcast, then let us know. Send us an email to vrroundtable at gmail.com and we'll try and rectify that as much as we can. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. So thanks for watching and we'll speak to you next time. Good night, everybody. <laughs>